for Frodo. Strap in, because it's a bumpy ride to Mount Doom. We're kicking down the Black Gates to the third and final installment of our Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Return of the King. So without further ado, and no restraint on spoilers, it's time to ask, what's the difference? Little housekeeping right out of the gate. One, we're dealing with The Return of the King's special extended edition for the finale of our three-part series, because why not? And two, in the last episode of What's the Difference, you might remember we noted huge sections of the Two Towers book that wound up in the Return of the King movie. So we're gonna deal with those first. If you'll remember, Frodo, Sam, and Gollum, or FSG to their friends, get released by Faramir immediately in the book, instead of being dragged to Osgiliath as they were in the movie. But FSG's journey to the secret stairs plays out pretty much the same. However, all three of them make it to the top of the stairs and into Shelob the giant spider's lair together. While Sam and Gollum have a very contentious relationship in both book and movie, it's only movie Gollum that plots to turn Frodo against Sam. And the confrontation on the stairs where Gollum frames Sam for eating all their food is an invention for the movie. The book version of Shelob's lair has Frodo and Sam getting separated. Gollum attacks Sam, trying to sideline him while Shelob takes care of Frodo. But Sam wins the fight and Gollum just scampers off. Then after Shelob stings Frodo, paralyzing him, Sam fights off the giant spider as well. In the movie, Sam discovers Gollum's frame job on the way back down the stairs, then hustles back up, arriving after Frodo has tossed Gollum down a crevasse and been stung by Shelob, but just in time to rescue Frodo from being eaten by the giant spider. Let him go, you filth. And when the orcs come passing by, Sam hides nearby where he overhears that Frodo is actually not dead. Gasp! In the book, after Sam fights off Shelob, he takes the ring from Frodo's seemingly lifeless body and even puts it on to hide from the incoming orcs. And seeing the orcs take Frodo back to their tower, Sam decides to pursue them, thus ending their part in the Two Towers book. In the movie, however, this is two and a half hours into the special edition runtime of The Return of the King. The movie version also leads us to believe, at least for a while, that the orcs have unwittingly come into possession of the One Ring. But let's rewind a bit to get the other half of the book caught up to the movie. Back in the book version of The Two Towers, Aragorn, Gimli, Legolas, and Gandalf, or AGLG if you're cool, have helped Rohan defend Helm's Deep from Saruman's Horde, which is where The Two Towers film leaves off. But the book follows them all the way back to Isengard to confront the defeated Saruman. The chapter titled The Voice of Saruman is actually the first time we meet the treacherous white wizard in the book. He's talked about a great deal and obviously very influential throughout Fellowship and Two Towers, but we don't actually meet him until a book and a half into the trilogy. The meeting with Saruman is basically the same in both mediums. They show up, Saruman throws some shade at Theoden and Rohan, an obvious bad guy Grimma Wormtongue is there, and Gandalf blows up Saruman's staff. However, there's one major difference. In the movie, it ends with Grimma stabbing Saruman and the wizard falling with the splat from the top of Isengard, letting the Palantir fall with him. In the book though, Grimma just heaves the Palantir angrily down at Saruman, like a kid trying to throw rocks, and the meeting ends with AGLG leaving Saruman and Grimma locked securely in Isengard. Then, later that night, at an encampment a short ride away from the wizard's tower, Pippin picks up the Palantir, allowing Sauron to see into his mind, as opposed to the movie that adds a big party back at Edoras to celebrate the victory at Helm's Deep before Pippin's curiosity gets the better of him. It should also be said that the Palantirs are better explained in the books. The movies largely play them off as a direct line of communication to Sauron, but the book explains further. There were once many Palantir and could also be controlled by the King of Gondor, which is how Aragorn is able to bend it to his will, but more on that later. And that pretty much catches the books back up with the movies. From here on out, everything we talk about takes place in both book and film versions of The Return of the King. He can hold his liquor. The book opens with Pippin and Gandalf hustling towards Minas Tirith. The beacons of Gondor are already lit, which is a more significant difference than you might think. This means that movie Theoden doesn't grapple with whether or not to help Gondor after Gondor failed to help them. It also means that Pippin doesn't sneakily light the beacon after Denethor, steward of Gondor and father to Boromir and Faramir, proves he's kind of an ass and refuses to call for aid. Rule of Gondor is mine and no others. Once the beacons are lit, AGL and Rohan take off for war, stopping at this rad cliff halfway up a mountain. It's here that Elrond of Rivendell comes to visit, finally giving Aragorn Narsil, reforged and renamed Andruil, the Flame of the West. Remember, in the book, he's had Andruil since he set out from Rivendell with the Fellowship of the Ring. But at this point in the movie, Arwen has convinced her father to give hope to men by reforging the sword for Aragorn. Getting the sword at this stage is an important stop in movie Aragorn's journey. 
Book Aragorn is antsy to reclaim the throne of Gondor from the beginning, but movie Aragorn is less enthusiastic, worried that the failure of Isildur has been handed down to him through the generations. But with Elrond's coaxing and the sword reforged in hand, Aragorn is now ready to take up the mantle of king and journeys into the heart of the mountain to recruit a dead but super badass army. In the book, Adriel and Rohan get ready for war as soon as they leave Isengard. After all, the beacons are lit and Sauron's forces are on the move. On the way to muster all their forces at that rad cliff, they're joined by more of Aragorn's people, the Dúnedain, rangers from the north. They're the ones that give Aragorn the idea to take the dead road through the mountain to recruit the ghost army. But book Aragorn's journey into the mountain isn't as quick as it is in the movie, where AGL stroll into the mountain, confront the dead king, and boom, just escape past the avalanche of skulls, nothing to it. In the book, the Dúnedain accompany AGL, and the ride goes through the mountain and out the other side to the Stone of Erech, the ancient black stone where the promise to fight for Isildur the dead army broke was first made. And it's not the ancient blade reforged that persuades the dead army, because again, that's old news. Instead, it's a standard made for Aragorn by Arwen, his elvish sweetie, that bears the mark of the King of Gondor. So in a way, this is not a difference. In both mediums, it's Arwen sending a token to Aragorn to persuade the dead to join the fight. In the book though, Aragorn releases the dead army after taking over the fleet of ships sailing to Sauron's aid. It's just AGL, the Dúnedain, and a handful of other men that continue on to Minas Tirith and to battle. And at this point in the story, things begin to line up across both book and movie for a little bit. A few details vary, but mostly, Aragorn and an army are headed back to Minas Tirith, Rohan's army is hustling to Gondor, while Gan Gandalf is mustering the city's defenses against Mordor's siege. Then the Battle of Pelennor Fields plays out in a very similar way. Rohan charges into the fray, fights off Southrons on Oliphants, all the way down to the way Eowyn kills the Witch King of Angmar, chopping the head off his flying beast and all. There are several differences surrounding Denethor, steward of Gondor. First, he's got a palantir too hinting that either Sauron or Saruman has contributed to his madness. Another is in the timing of Denethor's pyre. In both book and movie, Denethor has gone mad with grief and orders his men to burn he and his son Faramir, whom he thinks is dead. In the book, when Pippin finds Gandalf to tell him this, Gandalf is about to head out to the fields to help Theoden and Rohan battle against the Witch King, choosing instead to remain in the city and deal with Denethor. This is a choice that haunts Book Gandalf, and he blames himself for Théoden's death at the hands of the Witch King. But once Aragorn shows up with his crew, the Battle of Pelennor Fields is basically over and the healing can begin. In the extended edition movie, we see Aragorn healing Eowyn, but the book features a ton more healing. Tolkien spends a lot of time detailing how the hands of the true king are hands of healing. And so, Aragorn not only heals Eowyn, but also Faramir and Merry and pretty much everybody else. He literally spends all night going from tent to tent healing people. But once that's done, their thoughts turn back to Frodo in the ring. They make the decision to march on the Black Gates as a diversion in hopes that Frodo can sneak through Mordor. In the movie, Aragorn uses the Palantir they recovered from Isengard to show Sauron his shiny new Narsil as a way to taunt the Dark Lord. But at this point in the book, Aragorn reveals that he did that way back in Rohan right after the Battle of Helm's Deep. So Sauron should still be good and taunted and they can just head over to Mordor whenever. And so a few days later, they do, arriving in force at the Black Gate of Mordor greeted by the mouth of Sauron. In the book, he's got flaming eyes and nostrils as opposed to the movie in which he's got this super gross mouth. My master, Sauron the Great. The welcome. And while the meeting goes largely the same in both mediums, with the mouth of Sauron taunting Aragorn and company with Frodo's mithril, Bookmouth gets to keep his head at the end of the negotiations, whereas Movie Mouth. I guess that concludes the negotiations. It should be noted there's also a structural difference here. At this point in the movie, we know exactly what happened with Frodo's mithril and how it came into Sauron's possession, so we're comfortable in the knowledge that Frodo's in fact not dead. In the book though, Tolkien pulls one of his old Two Towers tricks, finishing up a good portion of AGL's tale, then rewinding back to tell FSGs. Because when the fighting starts at the Black Gates, not only is the reader under the impression that Frodo may be dead, he also leaves us with a cliffhanger, implying that Pippin dies in battle before rewinding to start FSG's side of the story again. So, rewinding to catch back up with Frodo, Sam, and the ring, the second half of The Return of the King opens with Sam creeping into the orc's tower to rescue Frodo. This plays out the same in book and movie, the only difference being that Sam slips the ring on one more time to evade the tower guards. Ultimately though, there's no real consequence for this action. Sam is just as reluctant to part with the ring when it's time to give it back to Frodo in the movie in spite of the fact that movie Sam never tried it on. Tolkien also gives us a time reference right as Frodo and Sam start towards Mount Doom, pointing out that meanwhile, Theoden was dying on Pelennor Fields in Gondor 
Meteor, something we read about 100 pages or so earlier. But from there, the journey into Mount Doom is basically the same in the book and movie. Sam and Frodo disguise themselves as orcs, get picked up by some marching soldiers, and even though they didn't start it, they sneak off when a fight breaks out in the ranks. The book does stretch time some in this section, with about a week passing during their trek across Mordor. But the movie doesn't make the trip seem instantaneous either. We see Frodo and Sam stop for breaks and falling asleep as day turns to night. Point is, in both book and movie, it's a long, exhausting journey for two short, exhausted hobbits. When Gollum catches up with them at the last minute, their fight is the same as well. Gollum fends off Sam, then bites the finger, ring and all, right off Frodo's hand. The only real difference is that Gollum just kind of falls into the volcano while he's dancing happily with his precious. The whole bit where Frodo takes them both over the edge, struggling for the ring, then dangles there for a suspenseful but very much seen before beat of tension was created for the movie. And then, boom goes the mountain. Sauron is defeated, his forces disband, and the men of the West are victorious, and the book has as many endings as the movie does. While Peter Jackson's final 40 minutes on screen, or 18% of the total runtime, painstakingly wraps up every major plotline from the actual death of Sauron through the crowning of Aragorn and all the way to setting sail with the elves to the Undying Lands, it's actually not as long an ending as it could have been. There's a whole chapter titled Many Partings that is not an exaggeration. In fact, it might be called Too Many Partings. <laughs> we see Theoden's funeral and Eomir becoming king of Rohan, Faramir and Eowyn getting hitched as well, even Treebeard gets to pop back up and say goodbye, but for Tolkien's hobbits, the journey back home presents them with one final hurdle. Well, yes, it's hard for them to return to such a normal life after their adventure, just like it is in the movie, so we'll call it two final hurdles. In their absence, the Shire has been taken over, occupied by a hostile force. Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin return from their long journey across Middle-earth to find a group of men have taken charge and instituted a sort of martial law in the Shire, forcing hobbits under an almost dictatorial rule and ruining the once pristine Shire with the marks of industry. Faced with ruffians as soon as they get back to town, our four heroes spring into action, rallying the hobbits of the Shire to pick up arms and revolt. Following Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin's lead, the hobbits get real angry. All of Hobbiton attacks the occupying force in what becomes known as the Battle of Bywater, in which 70 of the ruffians were killed along with 19 hobbits. Frodo was there, but he didn't even draw his sword because he was too busy keeping his fellow hobbits from brutally murdering the ruffians that surrendered to the bloodthirsty horde of halflings. But while all this may seem like just a tacked on end to their story, there's one more crazy difference here. After the Battle of Bywater, the hobbits discover who was behind the occupation of the Shire all along. It was... Dun dun dun! Saruman! He had escaped Isengard with Wormtongue in tow and took this final bit of revenge on the hobbits. But Frodo being a real cool guy and the biggest hero of this whole story, really, tells Saruman to scram and never come back. Eventually though, Saruman does die in basically the same way he does in the movie. Frodo, who doesn't want the bad karma of killing a once great wizard in the Shire, instructs his people to let Saruman go. And he doesn't even change his mind when Saruman tries to freaking stab Frodo, but only hits Mithril instead. But then our old friend, most obvious of all bad guys, Grimma Wormtongue, finally snaps under the abuse and stabs Saruman in the back, only to be taken down himself by several hobbit's arrows. And finally, the book and movie wrap up with very similar final chapters. Frodo finishes his book and decides to leave for the Grey Havens along with Bilbo, Gandalf, and the elves. Sam, of course, is very sad, but in both the book and the movie, Sam returns to the Shire from seeing off Frodo, takes his family in his arms, breathes deep, and to show he's able to move on from the journey that started years ago, he says, I'm back. Woo! Well, I'm beat. Ah, uh, me too. That giant copy of Lord of the Rings on my desk for the past three months has been such a heavy burden to bear. I think I might go chuck it into a volcano. At least all those post-its, anyway. Thanks for making it all the way through our three-part Lord of the Rings-tacular. As always, make sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more What's the Difference? Counts as one!